Hello, and uh, welcome to a Learn Masters series. Today, our topic is artificial intelligence, and our guest is Morten Goodwin, who is a professor at the University of Agder and at Oslo Met. Welcome, Morten. Thank you. So nice to be here. Morten, you are, uh, I think, my favorite, one of my favorites uh -huh. uh, within AI <laughs> in Norway. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So this is a conversation in four parts uh, that results in four mini lectures uh, that is intended to open up a topic to anyone willing mm -hmm. to listen. In this case, the topic is artificial intelligence. And, uh, uh, you know, there, there are really good courses on the topic in Coursera. Absolutely. And there is the elements of AI mm -hmm. and there are the university courses. And there is a plethora of stuff also on TED. But what we are trying to do is a slightly different pitch. Basically, our style is informal. And it is as if you met a person you know on the street. You're a professor of AI. And you're trying to teach them your subject over an extended lunch, if you wish. And uh, it's sound first, so we don't use any slides. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to paint pictures in this uh, lunch. This sounds very exciting. So I think key to what you're doing is teaching the public about such an important topic, which artificial intelligence is. It's a revolutionary technology and it needs to be consessed by the masses, I think. I think your point here is extremely important. So I'll just add one more sentence before sure. we go into the kind of structure mm -hmm. of it. And uh, uh, what you just said now, I think there exist good courses on AI, but very quickly they get very technical. Right. And people get scared. And, you know, they need, they think I need to learn programming. I need to learn, uh, I need a master in data science. I, you know, I need a lot before I can really talk about AI. While AI is going to be the most revolutionary tool of every business in the next decade. Absolutely. And it's the application of AI that we are very, very keen on, right? Absolutely. And I, I often compare it to driving a car. So most people know how to drive a car. They know how to turn the wheel. They know when to press the gas pedal. Uh, and a few people knows how a motor works, how the gear shift works, combustion engine works. And I think it is exactly the same with artificial intelligence. Some people need to be the typical nerds that drive themselves into the technology, that do the programming, etc. But a lot of people uh, will interact with artificial intelligence in their business, in their home uh, environment, in their uh, hobbies. Uh, uh, and they need to know what artificial intelligence is, what it isn't, what the faults are, what the positives are, and what the drawbacks of using a technique that is so uh, intelligent as artificial intelligence is in the public and private sector. So there needs to be a lot of knowledge on the use of artificial intelligence. I think that is why such a masterclass like this one would fit perfectly to uh, the masses. But I agree with you. If you want to delve into it, it's a lot of courses online that you can use the mathematics, for example. And it's beautiful and it's uh, amazing. And uh, I, I, I worked in AI some 20, 25 years ago, uh, basically on the algorithm side before mm -hmm. we really called it AI. Mm -hmm. But but uh, I'm just amazed at the, the development in the last five years. Uh, it's shocking. Uh, all of us Absolutely. who have been working in the field. And, and so it, it is an amazing tool. It's a, it's, it's a dangerous tool and mm -hmm. it's a necessary tool. And we are going to, so I love your um, uh, uh, description of, you know, what did you have to learn when you got your driver's license? Mm -hmm. It's exactly how I try to talk about what people need to learn about other technologies as well as AI. Basically, I think we need to just think about what you did when you got your driver's license. Mm -hmm. You need to learn the concepts. You need to learn how the thing works, and then you need to learn a tiny bit about, you know, okay, there is an engine, there mm -hmm. is some fuel, there is, you know, this is where I, this is why I'm pressing these different buttons, mm -hmm. and this, that sort of thing we need to know with AI, and then you need to learn the traffic rules, you need to learn where you have to be careful, you know, what's the driving ethics in the country exactly. you're yeah, in, yeah. Absolutely. And, and that's the sort of thing we're going to try to explore here. So it'll be four parts. First part will be the what you actually described now, what you know, what it is, what it isn't, mm -hmm. what's the good, what's the bad, basic concepts. 
the second part will be uh, your favorite examples mm -hmm. uh, in depth. The third part will be the tools of the trade, or or you know what are the what are the bit parts of the engine, and how do people get started? And the fourth part, I'm uh, I'm abusing you a little bit, okay. uh, exploiting your uh, experience and your mm -hmm. intelligence okay. uh, on <laughs> the topic of learn. So All we're right. going to have a workshop. And right. we are going to uh, talk about, I want people to start thinking about their own company. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to do that through an example. And so we're going to play with Learn. What what should Learn do with AI? And then I'd like people to think about, well, what can I do with AI in my company, my job? Oh, that's, sounds good. It sounds like an exciting journey. Uh, and I very much look forward to everyone, with every bit of it, but especially the last part, because it's when you get your hands dirty, when you get, try to uh, understand what can I do, what can I do in my business, that's when you really start to learn what, you, what AI really is. Excellent. So then let's get into the first lecture, mm -hmm. which is uh, what is AI? Why, uh, so... Um, actually, before we start about AI, Morten, would you mind please telling us just in a minute who is Morten and why oh. is he interested in AI? Oh, that, good question. So, well, I'm a professor, as you said, in computer science, in, uh, mostly in University of Agder, but also I have my arms in some businesses and some other places as well. Um, uh, and I've been working with computer science since I was a little kid, since my Commodore 64. Uh, but during my bachelor's, which is almost 20 years ago now, I was introduced to this new fascinating topic, which turned out to be uh, not only revolution, revolutioning of the field, but also revolutioning my background, because I understood that artificial intelligence uh, was a completely new way of making machines think. Uh, up until then, I've been working on just making everything uh, in a software program uh, specifying absolutely everything. Um, that was very fun. But then I understood that uh, the future is not like that. The future has to be that the software learns in some way. And that is mostly what artificial intelligence does. And then I did my PhD and I was an associate professor for some time. And then a bit more than a year ago, I became a full professor at the uh, University of Arctur. Uh, You've also written a great book. Oh, thank you. Yes, it's only in Norwegian, unfortunately. It's called uh, uh, Myten of Machine or The Myth of the Machines, which is kind of doing the same thing that's, that we're trying here. It is to teach the masses of artificial intelligence. So, and Because I think key to avoiding the hype of artificial intelligence and avoiding the scare of artificial intelligence is to learn and teach people about what it really is. So there's no robots taking over. There's no... Uh, job uh, market without uh, humans, for example. It is a powerful, powerful tool that most people use every day if they use a cell phone or if they use a social media or if they watch Netflix or anything like that. And it is a tool that is uh, will be more and more powerful in the years coming. Hmm. Very cool. So, um, so AI. Mm -hmm. um, there are many places to read the story of it. In sure. one way, we could start with, you know, the old Greek philosophers and uh, the first idea of uh, automated slaves. I think it was Aristoteles or some. Uh, Probably, yeah. And, Thanos, and then, yeah. And, and, and then we have these, uh, um, you know, technical developments, mm -hmm. uh, maybe some 50, 60 years ago. The, the, can you tell us? And, and, but then something happens. There is this exponential something sure. that hit about five years ago. So mm -hmm. how, how would you tell the story of AI in uh, three minutes? Well, in three minutes, it's a big story, but a lot of uh, a lot of uh, the history of AI comes uh, after the Second World War in the fifties and sixties. Uh, Alan Turing is a person that many people have heard of. Uh, he talked about artificial intelligence uh, in a mathematical and philosophical way, meaning that he said, uh, "Can we make machines think?" And his general idea was that if we were able to make a machine act in a way that it acts intelligently, we have uh, made artificial intelligence. So it's kind of a game of uh, persu persuasion, making sure that the other people believes that you act intelligently, something that you address outside. Uh, and some people disagree with him, uh, but uh, most say that it makes sense. Uh, as long as uh, my software or my robot does something smart, it is really intelligent. 
And then, of course, a lot of technical things happen in the same area. Uh, there's some famous names. Uh, one is called Marvin Minsky, another goes Frank Rosenblatt. Uh, they worked with uh, techniques uh, that we today would call uh, neural networks. Uh, and it, the idea is that you have some sort of uh, brain-inspired uh, software or hardware that has sensors that uh, are connected to other sensors, uh, and they call those sensors neurons, artificial neurons, and the neurons were connected with synapses. And the idea, general idea, was that these neurons and synapses should learn from the environment to recognize images or recognize uh, ways in a maze, etc amazing revolutionary uh, techniques uh, but i think the world around didn't understand how revolutionary it was because uh, they did really rudimentary stuff uh, meaning it could look at a picture and see whether it's a circle or a square or a triangle or this type of thing uh, uh, very uh, fun, fun nice but what is the real application area for that uh, and for that to really be understandable time had to pass and what re, uh, and uh, there was a uh, eye opening of artificial intelligence in the 50s and then it kind of went into an ai winter when we when people understood that it was not really those conscious robots at all it was something much more simpler and then uh, i think my famous scientist uh, who is still alive called jeffrey hinton in the 1980s i think in 1986 he was still working on those very old-fashioned techniques of neural networks, uh, this time in a software type of way. And in, he invented something which, which is called backpropagation, and that is really just a method to uh, strengthen some synapses and weaken some other, making sure that it actually learns in a very, very efficient way. So that means that you can take a software and you can make sure that it uh, uh, learns either uh, a, a image part, this is a cat, this is a dog, or text part, Part or good student, bad student, whatever you want, just based on these kind of brain-inspired techniques. Again, nobody really cared because in the 80s, it was very, very rudimentary. Uh, and some people worked on it, of course, but I think what really sparked the revolution that we're in now is was, was Hinton in 2012, who uh, was in a, a competition uh, on the internet called ImageNet. And the idea is then that you could uh, submit whatever algorithm you wanted. It could be AI based, it could be based on some other technique. And it was the idea was to recognize the difference between cats and dogs and horses and brooms or whatever you like. Every, uh, everyone, uh, every technique had uh, faults, meaning that uh, it categorized a dog wrongly as a cat or something like that in one fourth of the cases. So very bad. So three fourths of the cases, it was correct, but one fourth of the cases were wrong. Hinton had uh, an error rate much, much, much lower. In, I think it was 12%, not 25%, but 12%. And then after some more work, it was down to seven. And then after some more work, it was down to three or 4%. Uh, Can I just stop you, Morten? Yes. Because I remember the competitions, you know, knowing a dog from a cat mm -hmm. seems like an easy task for humans. But of course, for a machine, sometimes a chihuahua looks very much like a Siamese. And then there are all these funny examples that we don't think are very hard until we see those images, the, the chihuahuas and the muffins exactly. or the, yeah, yeah. You know, the Chinese folded dogs and folded towels. Um, Absolutely. And, and if you really look into an image uh, as it's uh, seen as a com from a computer software point of view, it's pixels, meaning that it's numbers in an organized matrix. So it's uh, what is the characteristic of a cat. Can you formally define what a cat is or a dog is or a muffin is? It's very, very hard based on just these type of numbers. So and, as humans, want, yeah. yeah, as humans, and evolutionary, you know, we have, we're perfect at this. But yes, machines are a little bit harder. Yes. The interesting thing is, you know, what you just said now, we humans don't think of it as hard because mm -hmm. evolution, exactly. uh, millions of years of evolution have actually formed us into being really good at reading the world. Absolutely. with our eyes and and uh, we're trying to teach a computer to do that within you know a few days of training mm -hmm. and why is it important that the computer could should know a cat from a dog well um the self-driving cars mm -hmm. need to recognize people on the street but they also need to recognize traffic lights and other cars and snow from markings or these 
computers that are now doing image analysis on cancer images mm -hmm. need to, or uh, radiologist images, they need to recognize normal cells from cancer cells. So these are extremely applied problems that were absolutely unreachable only a few years ago exactly. until Jeffrey Hinton started getting to, you know, a couple of percent error exactly. rate. Uh, true, uh, that, that is absolutely correct. And I think that, that when he was able to reduce the error rate this much, it opened up uh, like a, almost like a Cambrian explosion. Everybody wanted to do uh, um, AI then, uh, and specifically neural networks. Sometimes we call it deep learning. Uh, but the essence is uh, uh, that AI is uh, techniques uh, are techniques that are doing something uh, in an artificial way, but uh, complex. So complex problem solving with AI. And much of it is uh, through learning. And this is exactly where, where it happened. And we often call it machine learning. So artificial so, intelligence. So I... Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, so, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to simplify. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I'm trying to reiterate uh, what you said. Uh, so I'm sure that I understood and maybe the, the audience understood mm -hmm. even more importantly. So we, can th so we talked about images here, but AI can be used for text, for sound, for image. Basically, it's reading many different kinds of inputs and then is able to find these patterns. Mm -hmm. And then you also talked about different levels of AI. So, you know, we can tell it what things are and then it can yep. recognize them again. Or what you just said now, it can start figuring it out on its own, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So there, there are levels of AI, as you say. Uh, much of what is applied today is what we call supervised. That means that there's some expert that says this is a cat, this is a dog, or this is a cancer cell, this is not a cancer cell, this is a traffic light, etc. And then it learns what are the patterns of a cat uh, based on uh, that type of system. Or you can, uh, it can be unsupervised. Unsupervised means that you give it a lot of data and it's supposed to find these patterns alone and say that here is a group of customers that are very similar and here's a group of customers that are different from the others, but they're still very similar. So this type of pattern. And that's typically what happens in a, when you watch a, a streaming service, you will get a recommendation. This is a video that you like. And the reason is that the AI has learned that you like these type of movies, you're in this group and it gives you this type of information. I just and want then, to say one more thing for people who are not data people or computer yeah. science people, because I think there is still this kind of magic about AI. Well, you know, how how the heck does it know where to drive or how the mm -hmm. heck does it know what I like when it comes to films? And I think it's really important to understand that first of all, we have to convert everything into data. So mm -hmm. when a computer, and there are these great chatbots now, you know, that can talk with you and you don't even realize it's not a human. Mm -hmm. How does it do that? Well, it listens to what you say. It converts that into data that then it understands as words and sentences. And eventually it has learned the right response mm -hmm. to those words and sentences, and it converts it back into data that gets played on your Absolutely. phone or yes. something. So yes. this conversion of a sound, an image, uh, health thing, mm -hmm. cancer or or something else, uh, DNA, uh, protein yeah. folding, financial yeah. concepts, everything gets turned into data patterns that computers then are very, very good at sorting. Exactly. So if you look closely, you can see that everything is uh, data for a computer software, uh, for a computer software, and, uh, and it's finding patterns. So uh, the example of chatbots, for example, there's AI that translates my sound waves into data, and there's AI that finds the correct response to that my question uh, and, uh, uh, so that it goes back, and there's AI that produces the question back to sound. And of course, this happens behind the wall for everyone. When I ask Siri or Alexa or anything, there's several steps of AI that's there. And key to it all is that it, it's not limited to images or audio or health data. It's basically whatever you have that can be uh, put into a computer in some way or a cell phone in some way, then you can uh, use AI for it. And, and that is key because that is kind of like uh, the internet or uh, computer, <laughs> everything. It It is at this level that it can do almost everything. It's very versatile. Uh, 
you just have to train it in the correct way. And that is also why it is such a revolutionary technique, because uh, you just have to imagine what it can do <laughs> and train it. But there's no magic to it, of course. There's uh, heavy mathematics uh, that you have to follow. Uh, and it is finding, if you think images, for example, it's finding that cat has these pointy ears, uh, dog has these long ears. And the same is true for cancer cells, or the same is true for my voice or red light, etc. So it's finding these patterns inspired by the human brain and the eyes and sound uh, mechanisms in our brain. But again, very different because it's more like mathematically sound. We have about 10 minutes more in this okay. first lecture mm -hmm. and uh, maybe 15. We, this is sure. the most important lecture, okay. so we can uh, go a little bit longer. <laughs> fine. Uh, one, I want to throw out two topics for you uh, that, we, that I'd like us to cover. One is help us understand in, with pictures almost, mm -hmm. you know, the different levels of AI. So I think we understand that AI can be then used for all kinds of things, you know, yep. from from reading uh, sensor data on an oil platform and mm -hmm. balancing that platform in 19 meter tall waves to to uh, looking at people's faces on cameras to let them in on oh, sorry on their mobile phones. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter whether it's an image or a, a temperature or a, a sound or financial data. This data is read by the computer in mm -hmm. applied AI. It understands the context and it can find the relevant patterns. But it can do that in very different ways, depending on how smart it is. So I would like us to talk about, especially demystify a little bit neural networks that okay. you mentioned and yep. deep learning. Because I think when people start, uh, you know, hearing some of the more statistical concepts, they get terrified. And, sure. and I just like them to understand how they can use it as a tool. The, <laughs> yep. the other question I have for you is the topic of general AI yep. versus narrow AI. And I'm just going to start with that right away. Okay, because AI, okay. AI sounds like this amazing thing. And then I think people get a little bit lost in general AI. And to be mm. honest, I don't care about general AI no. because I, I don't even like the idea. I think we humans should be, you know, taking the big directional decisions and I don't care if the machine cares or has, you know, feelings or not. I, I, sure. I, I look at it as a great tool. Mm -hmm. And what worries me is that all this discussion about uh, AGI. Uh, yes, AGI. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it kind of uh, removes the sense of urgency on narrow AI or applied yeah. AI, which is the revolution, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of questions there. So let's first separate between narrow and general intelligence. So uh, general intelligence is... Uh, the hypothetical future world where software, AI, uh, is at an intelligence level as humans, meaning that uh, Siri or Alexa or any of these robots or any other system has the same sort of level as me or you. Uh, and that we are nowhere near that. Uh, those uh, systems are very stupid. <laughs> uh, so that uh, maybe we will be there in, in the future somewhere, but it, it doesn't look like that now at all. Uh, can, can I just stop you for a second? Sure. I, I, I think uh, it's uh, it's really important what you said. You know, those systems are really stupid. Uh, uh, they, they are extremely stupid in some areas where exactly, the humans yes. are made yes. to be strong, yes. such as actually ethics and morals. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, the organic world is messy, and we are very robust in Absolutely. messy situations. Yes. Computers are amazingly much smarter than us in a structured world. Exactly, but in a very much more narrow world, and that is the key. So if you take chess playing for example some uh, tech, uh, ai is much much better than any human at playing chess uh, but it's a very very narrow problem uh, solving a chess game playing good at chess and then if you compare that to a general intelligence uh, uh, you cannot ask some of the soft the chess software to uh, talk or tell a joke or something like that it's like impossible <laughs> so there that's the difference so uh, ai is absolutely becoming smarter than us, uh, but at very, very narrow fields. Chess playing, for example, probably driving, uh, at least a lot of the medical uh, techniques, a lot of the financial, as you mentioned, which stock to buy at what time, uh, AI type of system. So it's smarter than us in uh, small areas, uh, but it means that it is very, very narrow. So that's the difference, narrow intelligence and then general intelligence. 
And as for the demystifying part, uh, it is absolutely finding uh, statistical uh, trends in the data. And I, my feeling is that the most understandable this way, because everything is just uh, trend, trends in the data, is to think of it as images, because we can see that there's a, a square or a circle or this type of thing. And when an AI recognizes a face or recognizes red light or green light, it is finding those type of patterns, meaning uh, if it looks for a crossing, it looks for a sign that says crossing in a self-driving car, and it looks at a red light, it looks for something that is round. And the point is that we don't really have to tell, let's say, a self-driving car that uh, that uh, the um, traffic light has three circles. You just have to give it a lot of examples. This is red, this is red, this is red, this is green, this is green, this is green. And then the point is that it picks up these type of patterns. And this is very similar to how you teach kids, really. Yeah, you don't explicitly say uh, it's a round thing, it's a green thing, etc. You say when the red is the light is red, stop. Or make make your your kids talk, for example. You don't tell yeah. that there exists a verb or noun, etc. You just give it a lot of examples, and then our kids find trends in the language and they learn a language. And similarly, it is with with AI. The difference is I, that it then can it can only do it narrowly, but very very advanced. I love uh, I love the examples of games uh, mm -hmm. because that's that's easy for people to understand. Uh, and uh, sometimes when I talk about the history of the subject, I, I like to talk about you know we had uh, deep uh, blue. Mm -hmm. And chess playing. Uh, sure. I, I forget the age, but maybe some thirty some years ago. Nineties, yeah, a little more, yeah, ninety-six. Yeah. I think ninety-seven, yeah. And mm -hmm. and Gary Kasparov lost, and he was uh, first shocked, and then he decided that you know he will understand AI and uh, the power of AI. Really interesting because, uh, for example, the computer made a mistake, which made Gary Kasparov lose, which put him completely off balance, and mm -hmm. and he thought the computer is smarter than it is. Uh, but actually, it was an error. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but they can. Uh, that's narrow, right? Because there's exactly lots, narrow. lots of uh, yeah. So, so deep blue is a very uh, good piece of technology. Uh, it is very little learning in deep uh, blue. Uh, so what it does is it uh, does searching, uh, searching for. Uh, uh, searching in a chessboard, meaning that if you put your uh, knight yeah. there, if you put your rook there, uh, the game is changed. And then if you put your rook first, and then your knight, and then your peasant, etc., then it, you get kind of a game which you lose. So it's kind of searching very, very many the times. The space of games. Yeah. Exactly. So that is that is deep blue, very impressive. It's similar to what uh, chess players do. They search, but uh, the, it can search much, much uh, further and much more quickly than Gary Gasparo. So what happens is, uh, I think five years ago or so, uh, no, yeah. Be, be, before you go there, yeah, uh, the, uh, the, I like, I'd like to mention this, a middle step, and I'd please. like to mention Jeopardy yeah, and uh, the Watson, which is also an IBM. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. extend, uh, extension of uh, Deep Blue. Yeah. And uh, uh, that was kind of smarter. We got a little bit surprised there because it could understand the natural language. It could tell that Big Apple refers to, to, to New York. So how was that different from Deep Blue? And why well, wasn't that as impressive as what came five years ago? I, th I think uh, the, the Jeopardy machine was also very, very impressive. And it has more elements of AI in it because it has some sort of natural language understanding, meaning that the uh, word such as Apple could be something you eat. It can be a type of computer, but also a big city in the eastern part of the uh, United States. Uh, uh, and but at the core, it's still a searching mechanism. So meaning that it had some sort of AI to formulate a question, find a pattern in the question, if you like, so that it could be understood by a human. And then it searches in a big, big, big database of knowledge. And then it responds back. Uh, truly impressive, uh, but the learning mechanism, which I would say is key to what we see uh, these last years, uh, was it was there, but not as much as we saw earlier. So it means that it's, it's kind of like begin, building a huge complex database with some AI on top. Very good, good at playing Jeopardy. The challenge is that if you want to do it something more, if you want to have a conversation with that Jeopardy machine or something like that, that's completely pos impossible that way. I think what really uh, maybe gave a lot of focus to AI 
the reason five years is what happened with uh, Google DeepMind when they first played a game called Go, which is similar to chess, uh, but uh, has uh, a bit a bigger search space, meaning it's more complex. Uh, and and then this type of traditional deep blue based searching mechanism uh, falls short. It, you cannot do it because it takes the lifetime of the universe to do it with today's computers. It's impossible. So what they did instead was to build some searching mechanism. It was led by a person called David Silver, very good uh, scientist. Uh, and, and you had some deep learning neural network mechanism. So the same as we do for image recognition, but it recognizes board states, saying that this board state is very good, this board state is very bad, <laughs> and then it kind of found the patterns in the pieces. So this is a good pattern, this is a bad pattern. So in addition to searching for steps, it also asked the AI, is this a good way or is this a bad way? So at the first, it gave it a lot of expert data saying, these are good games, <laughs> this is bad games, and then kind of picks up the trend from that. Uh, and it was able to beat the best uh, Go player uh, uh, by a lot. It was uh, five games, and uh, it even made some mistakes, or they believed it made some mistakes. Uh, it turned out it didn't put uh, uh, the Go player off, off board. Uh, the machine really won at the end. Uh, Amazing technique, much, much more learning in the form of machine learning than the big deep blue mechanism. What truly amazes me is that uh, David Silver and the team there took it further. It did something called um, uh, Alpha Zero, meaning that it avoided using uh, human data. Uh, so it just played against itself uh, in the beginning very badly uh, after a few seconds, much better than most uh, people. And after a few hours or days, it was done better than the human uh, level playing game. Uh, I, I, yeah. I think it's an absolutely amazing. Uh, by, by the way, uh, the sort of stuff that David Silver did uh, makes me uh, regain my uh, uh, strong belief in financing of uh, that kind of research. I mean, if you mm. think about the commercial effect of his Absolutely. breakthroughs here, he, he, he has gazillions for the world, and uh, and uh, we, we need we need more of David Silvers. Uh, but we also need people who know how to apply, understand, and apply the effect of what David Silver did, and then spread yeah. it to all kinds of industries. But what I want to say, what what one of my big kind of epiphanies here was uh, when they used, I think it was Alf DeepMind, mm -hmm. which is, uh, uh, company, I guess, company. the platform for Alpha, um on Atari. And I yeah, saw yeah. this play game of ping, uh, Pong, oh, mm -hmm. you know, where you, where you keep hitting the ball. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't tell the, the computer what is the goal of the game. It's not mm -hmm. like, you know, you have to stay alive as long as you can, or you have to hit the, the, the bricks at the top, or... You have to move this little lever mm -hmm. here to, to kick back the, the ball. It had yes. to figure it out on its own. Exactly. And then after a few hundred uh, runs of the game, it started playing this game better than humans mm -hmm. in the sense that it discovered strategies that humans don't, like, yeah. you know, digging a tunnel. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was amazing. It, it, it truly is. Uh, and that happens a little bit before uh, AlphaGo. Uh, and but they use the same type of reinforcement learning technique, and that means that you make a decision, and you uh, this this decision affects the environment. It displays breakout, which the game was called, uh, and then th that affects back. Uh, uh, and you might say, why do you care about the uh, AI that? plays breakout or go or chess. Um, well, it turns out that the, the same type of techniques you can apply to much more uh, world situations, medicine, uh, uh, self-driving, etc. And if you think of a game such as breakout, which most people know, or Pong or any of these other games, uh, there's a lot of uh, image recognition as we humans do. We understand where the ball is. We understand where the paddle is. We understand where the bricks are. Uh, but there's also, uh, and, and we do that intuitively, and then we have to make a decision. Do I move to the left? Do I move to the right? And without programming, without saying, if the ball goes to the left, go to the left. If the ball goes to the right, go to the right. It's it only got reinforcement, uh, feedback, positive or negative feedback, based on the number of points it got. So if it got more points, it gets positive feedback. If it gets less points, it gets negative feedback. And then and that is a very, very amazing way to think of it, because then it figured out all those types of details that are 
very natural to us, but not natural to a computer. Uh, and um, uh, uh, basically, the sky is the limit there, I think. There's still some drawbacks because um, Go, chess, and these type of uh, games, uh, they're very limited in scope, meaning that you, if you change a little bit, if you add a new piece to your chessboard or you change the pixel level, etc., it falls completely short, meaning that you have to retrain it again and again. So there's... Um, uh, even though it's immensely impressive, and I would guess mo one of the most impressive uh, scientific discoveries the last uh, 10, 15 years, I would say, this type of system, uh, uh, one of them. And then it is uh, still in this type of very, very narrow field, as we talked about earlier. It's, mm. it's um, uh, yeah, but it's truly impressive. Very good. Um we are going to go into our lecture two in a minute. I would just like to ask you uh, very briefly, what do you think are the greatest misunderstandings or myths that you would like to debunk? Oh, there, uh, there are many of them, I think. Uh, so uh, some of you touched upon already. One is that AI does not become smarter than us. That's kind of a myth. Uh, we've shown no, at least in narrow ways, it absolutely does. Uh, and another myth is that it becomes smarter uh, uh, by giving it more data only, meaning that you, if you have a system that works badly, you just have to give it more data and it becomes better. That's partly true, <laughs> but but you have to be very, very careful because it uh, it becomes just as good as the data you put into it. So in the chess games, etc., it's kind of easy to find more data, but in real world scenarios, it is often very difficult to find uh, enough data. In hiring people in HR, if you're doing policing, this type of thing, it's very, very hard to find high quality data. Uh, I think yes. uh, I think um, I, I'd like to summarize that in a way that you know you have to love the data, mm -hmm. but you also have to love the problem. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And you have to understand the data in respect to your problem. And in this case, we heard this statement, we heard, we hear this statement, that the data is the new oil a lot of times. And, and in, in a way, I partly agree with that, uh, but I partly also disagree because there's, you have to have a knowledge of the data that you collect. So meaning that if Tesla collects data, they have to understand exactly what to collect, how to store it and how to regenerate it uh, for uses. If I collect health data, I have to understand exactly what I do. So if I get some data outside of my field, I, I cannot use it in any way. So in this case, it's a bit different than uh, than oil. I think of data collection much more as patents. I have to have a good understanding of uh, my data in order to collect it. And when I collect it, I should have some sort of ownership to it because I've spent so much time collecting it. <laughs> and then it, you cannot really share data wealth, uh, same as you can share oil wealth. Mm -hmm. You can share some of it, but it has to be some sort of level that you actually gain financially from the data you collected. There's a lot of debate now. Should we share it? A, yes. Yeah. Please. I think that's a great point, Morten. So, uh, uh, you know, I think that the responsibility for sharing your data, where mm -hmm. you should be the one defining, you know, how I'm going to give this to the world, exactly. yes. you should be allowed to save some of the data just for you, if that's the core of your, and you should share the rest of your natural resource with the world in order yep. to, you know, help the world go forward. And, and that's, I think that's going to be a political question, a yep. technical political question where we need politicians and techie people to start talking in, in a little bit more refined way than just, you know, GDPR and we're mm. done. Mm. No, so, I, agree. So, I, I think that's, sure. that's key because, uh, because uh, as we said, you need some sort of financial gain for the data collection. If you said share everything at once, yeah, people won't collect, <laughs> but and it has to be some sort of way because you co often collect public data, so it has to be shared in some sort of way. Otherwise, you're giving yeah. all your, uh, you're putting all your money on one company and letting them control it. Traffic rules for data sharing, I think, is a is a very important uh, political discussion. And you know, if you say share everything, uh, it, it's even worse than well, who's going to be, uh, you know, financing the, yeah. the 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 continual gardening on this data, the the Absolutely. upkeep of the data, mm -hmm. the the refinement of the data. Who's going to be responsible for mistakes in the data? Mm -hmm. You know, if people expect you to have perfect data, perfectly shared, I mean, this is uh, infinitely costly. So so. Uh, how do we do this, I think, is a very... And this is somewhere where Norway could actually 
uh, lead the way because we have a lot of good public data and we have this trust. Uh, oh, I think uh, you, you're touching upon something very important there. And, and I think also it is the responsibility because uh, as you and I know, uh, but it's important to tell the audience, I think, is that uh, AI makes mistakes and oftentimes these mistakes come from faulty data. Not always, but often. Uh, and then somebody has to have the responsibility at some place. <laughs> and if you're just sharing the data uh, there, you're kind of leveling out the responsibility. Nobody's being responsible but if you're saying a company is collecting data and they make a mistake at least you have some somewhere to blame at least uh, yeah mm. very good um you have inspired me to pull in two more examples in the okay. next lecture we're going to sure. be talking about uh, games yeah we're going to be talking about uh, conversations mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about uh, protein, folding. protein folding yes and then right. i would like to ask you to talk also about um corona and uh okay. ai you know yeah. two or three examples of where it actually was useful i don't think people have realized enough about that and um yeah maybe maybe we'll stop there i i i possibly think public data is another super interesting example but let's see where it takes us we are saying thanks for lecture one and we'll be back on lecture two <laughs>